forth about what to do with that question. Study religion, yeah, but maybe become a religious sister, so I just turned up for a while. Yeah, but then I met my husband at 17, that was over. Uh, get my PhD and teach theology. Yeah, but then the bishops at the US uh, conference who I was working for wanted me to come in as a public voice. So do that. Uh, become a lawyer and work for justice, but don't get too far from religion, so read theology every day, and then teach law and theology. <laughs> so it's this, where is the most important question in one's life leading? I'm like a, I'm like a research test for everyone who has got a hundred different backgrounds wondering, what do I make of religion being the most interesting question and God being the most interesting hypothesis? In now my 35 year work in and with the church, um, what have I encountered that this book really spoke to uh, as both opportunities and problems? First, um, I'm an educator. Second, I'm gonna talk about the fact that I've worked in church bureaucracy. And third, about the fact that the questions that have been entrusted to me, and very much entrusted to me, God called me, in the only smells and bells experience I had in my life to take the job I took at the bishops' conference. Uh, and on, on issues that very much lend themselves to falling into the trap of moralism. So that's been sort of my, my 35 years with the church. So let me unpack those a bit. Of course, first, as an educator, I'm a parent who, uh, like so many, wants to transmit this faith to my children. Jasani makes you really ask why. Why? Is it pride? I won't lose this generation. I'm not going to be like my cousins or siblings or anyone else whose children doesn't practice. Is it a strategy to save your children from bad isms in the world that hurt them? Or rather, is it really to know Christ as a source of freedom and a source of the meaning of everything? I hope I have mostly graduated to the third, but the pride and the fear still tug. The other thing is that I have learned from Jasani uh, uh, and maybe I have trouble explaining this, is that you have, to, you have to constantly be in conversation, which you'll guess immediately is not tough for me. You have to be talking to your children and to any else, other, others that you educate about the distinction between what they're seeing in the world as the answer to everything and the Christian proposition, okay? You have to narrate distinctions. Description is useful, but as any good philosopher will tell you, distinctions are more important. And they only know how critical to see Christ as the meaning of everything is when they're comparing it to other things that offer themselves to the, as the answer to everything. My greatest regret is that I did not discover the, the, the CL community when I was younger so that I could bring my children into the presence of people who understood this communion as a fact of life earlier. It's probably my greatest regret as a parent that that was not known to me until later. And that, that my role as an educator didn't become clear to me um, in the way I should be doing it until I thought it was later. <coughs> the other aspect of my work is that I've been in the church bureaucracy. My job would write the bishop's opinions for the US Supreme Court. I would tell the bishop's opinions to the Congress. I would be on television and radio almost every week as an apologist, right, explaining why it is we are reasonable, why we are charitable, why we are consistent in principle across issues in the world that, that obliterate right and left political distinctions. I learned in that bureaucracy, I came out of 13 years of the bureaucracy, knowing beautiful people within it. But what I really came out of that bureaucracy with, and my husband will tell you, because I would come home from long, horrid trips, you know, sleeping on the floor in airports in Grand Rapids and Frankfurt and you know where, but more energetic than when I went away. Because at that point, I was encountering the people. And I remember the pro-life director in the Midwest whose daughter got pregnant when she was 18, who told me the story of her husband who was about to build his man cave in the basement because all the kids were gone. And she finds, they're talking about why the daughter seems to be a little distressed and the mother knows the daughter is pregnant. And she tells the husband this and he begins to swing his hammer and knock down the walls. She's like, honey, it'll be okay, don't lose it. And he goes, no, I'm okay, I'm just building a nursery and I better get started now. Because when does she do? These were the people I met. I met people who went from working in the pro-life movement to setting up warehouses for all the single moms they met where you could get everything down to the last teaspoon. And I came back 
feeling more called to my work because of who I saw out there. The greatest gift that the USCCV offered me was a plane ticket to every diocese in the US but one, about 100 days a year for 10 years. And I saw and I knew the Catholic community one at a time. And that was what I emerged from the bureaucracy that is still with me today. The other thing that is a uh, fact of my background that Chisani is utterly necessary for me to deal with is the following. I deal with issues that easily fall into moralism or intellectualism. Sex, marriage, parenting, pro-life. I always had an intuition that it wasn't good to present the issues in the way that they are so often framed out there. No, you can't. It's immoral. We have a rule for that. I knew it wasn't an entire Christian way of life. But at this time in history, these precise issues are the ones that are the ones the Catholic Church is beat up over. They're the ones that we are making our religious freedom claims about when charities or schools are required to cooperate with anything from contraception mandate to same-sex marriage. The and then, of course, we have the fact that the church that has these rules is now enmeshed in one of the great sex scandals of all times. <laughs> I always had an inclination toward synthesis. But then I, and, and I, I having read Giussani's trilogy like three times each, I knew that this was the direction to move. I was captured by the story in this biography where Giussani is riding his bicycle past a couple who are kissing in a kind of lover's lane. And he stops and he jumps out and he says to them, why did you jump apart? If what you're doing is good, then just go ahead, right? Because it's part of the good. It's part of what you ought to be doing. And then he's about to leave, and he comes back again, and he goes, have you thought about what you're doing is in relationship to the stars and everything there is? And I was like, that's the answers that I want. That's how I want to explain this to people. Imagine the difference if the Catholic Church could say, if even the little sisters of the poor who so bravely fought the contraception mandate could say instead of, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't do contraception, we say no. Instead of, they could say, we are a community that witnesses to the fullness of love. And when it comes to sex and its role in human life, we stand for a vision of sex that says tomorrow. It says your love looks toward tomorrow, looks toward kin, marriage, children, family, a future development of the two of you, a real union. And this love, we believe, points to people's understanding, getting a glimpse of what God looks like and what God's love is like and how we're supposed to treat other people. That's why we don't pay for contraception, because we're trying to build a community here. And these things flow out of it, not because the church says no. Okay? Jasani asks, is everything that you're doing, is everything that you're teaching in service of love? Does your expression about the male-female parent-child relationship point to ideal values? I don't have the brief answer to how we're going to communicate it, but I do know it's the right task, and I think it's my task. Finally, just a few brief themes in terms of actual educating. The first one that struck me from the book, from the introduction to the end, was Jasani's statements again and again about his obedience to the, to the church. And, and, and notwithstanding the incredible suffering that he experienced at its hands and at the hands of, of, of particular bishops, his own, at the hands of other people. Today, with the sex abuse scandal, the idea of obedience to this church is one of the furthest things from anybody's mind. Our credibility, and frankly, precisely on the issues that I write about, is nearly vaporized. I have had close-up work with members of the hierarchy. At one point, I believe it was Jasani or, or someone else quoted in the book, refers to them as the skeleton of the church. Not everything, but a framework. And however, even that framework, which has to stand, and which he talks about, especially in this book, Why the Church, is a kind of authority that was there from the very beginning. It was there. It was intrinsic to the community. Right away, there were people who rose up as leaders. Right away, they knew authority was part of the structure of the church. 
But I have spent time in a bureaucracy where this was not always evident that these people were the leaders we needed from the times. I remember being utterly scandalized when a priest, head of a diocesan vocation office, said casually something about, well, you got your A, your B, and your C-level priests. And I'm thinking, but yet Shasani says it's not about, it's not a meritocracy. It's a vocation. And it is about obedience as part of the structure of the community. And I thought, about how he experienced it and why his commitment to obedience, other than the times that he lived in, in which obedience was a factor when you were a Catholic, would have lent itself so generously to that. And I see that part of it was that he was always in dialogue, even with those people who were most trying to thwart him or who didn't understand him. He dialogued with people in leadership and eventually was able to have close dialogues with popes. Right? So he had dialogue with people he admired and was able, therefore, always intrinsically to maintain that obedience. Whereas if we're just thinking about it as a structural fact of the church, as a mandate, is, is more difficult to, to uphold. I do think, however, that today obedience is not <laughs> going to sell really well. And I think, overlapping something Greg said, that it has to come the way it came in the early Christian community again. It's going to have to be built up by small local communities, whether it's movements, parishes, groups at universities where we come again to understand that obedience to authority is part of our structure. I almost think we have to learn it all over again. The other thing I want to mention is the discussion about the needs of the human person as a, a person's path to God. I'm, I'm going over time here. I'll try and take just about another two minutes. Is the needs of the human person as a path to God. To me, what a genius method, especially for today, when people are so very na navel-gazing when identity politics is ruling the roost, when to begin with what people are really looking for is a definite conversation starter. But always also to ask people to say, you also need to know that other people are living with these needs and these desires as well. And not only to look toward your own as a path toward actual freedom, as a path toward a glimpse of God, but to understand that literally every other person on the street has these. Okay? To me, this is the Good Samaritan story as a limiting principle. We're always freaked out by the Good Samaritan story. Everybody lying in your path? Well, God only puts so many people in your path. Our physical being limits the number of people we're going to encounter and help. But this method of thinking about our needs and desires, but also asking the person to do it with others that they meet, is a brilliant method for introducing people to the way of love and eventually the way of Christ. Finally, the necessity of positivity. Another really hard saying at this time in the world of education. Jasani says, the problem is not finding victory as relief inside a death, but the meaning of death inside the fervor of a life. Wow. You know, I've kind of thought of life as like getting a few minutes to breathe between labor pains. I'll just be frank. Okay, I remember when the nurse said that to me when I was delivering my first child. Try to relax between labor pains. And I had two thoughts. One is, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> and number two is, wow, that's kind of been my philosophy. It's probably not a good one. I think as a parent and as an educator, it is a requirement to be positive. It is a requirement to have hope. Because I have brought these children into the world, I am one of their but-for causations. Because it is the only logical outcome of a faith in which God is not dead but has resurrected. It's hard for me because of the issues I work on, which have seen such a dramatic difficulty in the world today, where, where the church stands alone, and as you hear the way I talk about it, isn't doing such a great job talking about it. And it's a struggle to be a person who is. It is difficult for me, but I do know, and I take such great solace from Jasani, that life has to be more than taking a breath between labor pains. Finally, I worked with Cardinal O'Connor, and I remember all the Sisters of Life, who were the order he founded, always wanted to have lunch with me and talk to me and get as much out of me as I could about what I took from the charism of Cardinal O'Connor. And now I understand their thirst, because I am jealous of all of you who actually got to walk with Jasani after reading this book. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Greg and Helen.
Before any questions, Alberto, I just want to see what response you might have. If you want to make any comments, given what we've heard. How many hours I have? I don't know if I can stop you. So. No, no, no. It's difficult for me, for me to speak in English. So, so but I was struck by some of the issues uh, you talk about, uh, and I realized that some points are common you. Uh, you, you express it in different ways, but uh, I think that the issues are the same. Uh, first, uh, first, first of them, what you Greg talk about, the goal of Papa Giussani to arise sleeping once. This was uh, an, object, an obsession for Giussani from the very beginning, where he decided to, to let the theological career in the Venegono Seminary decided to, to go to teach in a high school in Milan. That person was conscious of their humanity. Uh, there, there, there was a, an episode in uh, 1986 that happened in uh, Ukraine, in Russia, the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl. And Giuseppe used it to take uh, some news uh, as a, meta a sort of metaphor of the human life. And he said, I quote, we live in, in a situation characterized by a weakness of energy of consciousness. It's as if young people today were all full of the radiation from Chernobyl. Structural, structurally, they their organism is the same as before, but dynamically is not the same. What surrounds us causes us to be estranged from our very selves. It's like there is no real evidence anymore aside from trends. People's leap for was a, a big problem for Dusan. And uh, he, he asked it to himself. How can you arise the people? Forcing uh, him to, to do something with a strategy, with a panel of uh, uh, moral rules? No. He gave the witness of what happened in him, an encounter. An encounter with someone is the only possibility to rewake a person. And he learned this precisely in his youth, when he was in seminary, and he got in crisis, discovering the fundamental question. Because you said both that for Giussani, Christ is the answer to the human needs. And this was fundamental for him. He said, I have just. he realized that the weakness of Christian experience derived from the fact that faith becomes incomprehensible if people's needs are not taken seriously. Because for Giussani, when he was very young, at 15 years old, in seminary, Christ was the discovery, was the answer to his personal needs not something imposed from the external, but discovered in the internal of his soul, in this experience. And this was the reason why he realized in the 50s, before other people, that Christ became an extraneous to the life people, just a word the personality of the past, but not uh, present like a friend, sharing with people the answer. This is the reason why you, you talk about the uh, abortion, when he corrected the title of the cover story of his Sabbath. We don't start from 32%. 
we start from one. One with a capital F. That, that one was Christ. The only that can put the person in the condition to live the different circumstances with hope, with that positivity you stressed at the end of your intervention. But this positivity has a very profound reason in Giussani. Because the, the mystery for him is a very protagonist of the of the of life. And this is the reason why for uh, it's interesting that you synthesize all the the life of Giussani with the word obedience. It was not a basic at the beginning a moral obedience, but uh, uh, I can say an ontological obedience. Because obedience uh, for Giussani was the method that the mystery chosen in order to conduct, to drive the, the eye, the person, to the destiny. A few days before uh, his death, uh, in the last encounter with uh, his sister Lydia, the, that, was, that is uh, right now a rebel, he said, remember, I obeyed. I always obeyed. Because this is a method. To obey to what? To the reality. Because for you son, Christ is part of reality. Is the meaning of reality. When uh, he had the, what he called the beautiful day, when he was 15 in seminar, in high school, in the seminar to become priest, he said, from that moment, when he realized that Christ was the answer to his personal needs, from that moment, the instant, that to say, this moment in which I'm talking and you are hearing, was no trivial for me. Every instant of his life was important because it depends on the mystery that became flesh in Christ. So there is a, an expression he used that to describe this situation that was so impressive for me. If I found I read, I, I read. But I don't know. So the greatness of Christian faith is the following. Christ answered the human question. So, those who accept and lead the faith have a common destiny together with those who do not have faith and drown in the question, despair in the question, suffer in the question. This is the reason why for Giussani the faith and happiness of uh, his brother man was uh, an obsession because uh, he discovered that Christ answering to his question is, that, is the same answering to the question of everybody because uh, the